Welcome to the AV1611 Hour. My name is Nelson Turner, and this broadcast is dedicated to the King James Bible, the Word of God in the English language for the end-time English-speaking peoples of the earth. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 14. Uh, people look at this as a get-out-of-jail card for a whole nation. But this of itself necessitates confession of sin and forgiveness of sins. And the topic today is going to be confession of sin. Uh, I've studied it distinctly and uh, at length over the years and through my own experience and then comparing my own experience to the Bible, I've found out that there are general confessions of sin, then there are particular or uh, itemized confessions of sin, to put it bluntly. There's the con general confession of we're in sin, we've committed all these different sins, they're more than the hairs on our heads, and uh, we're just overwhelmed with our sin, but God, we ask you to forgive us for it. Then there's the itemized or particular sins repented of, confessed and repented of one by one, and that's what we as individuals should do on a moment by moment basis. We shouldn't wait till the end of the day or wait till we can go talk to the pastor and have him tell us it's okay. There's no such thing like that in the Bible anyway, and that's a, you know, this Romish thing. There is in the Bible, of course, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. But 2 Chronicles 7:14, while Solomon is here praying, he says this in verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This whole verse shows that God doing certain things is predicated upon people doing certain things. That God healing the land is predicated upon them for being uh, humble, penitent, contrite for their sins, and confessing their sins. This is 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, see, he says my people, not somebody that's not his people, but those that are his people, which are called by his name. So this specifically, in a very real sense, applies to Christians because we are named with the name of Christ. The name Christian was given to those that follow Jesus Christ as a derogatory type of name, but it became a name that was a badge, as it were, of distinction and separation from the world. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. When you humble yourself, you put yourself in a position below the one you are talking to or the one you are seeking. When my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and then what? Turn from their wicked ways. It's not just enough to confess your sins, but then you need to actively turn from your sins. Not do the sin, then turn around and do the sin again. Not confess the sin, understanding that you're going to go commit it as soon as you get done confessing it. This is the way of the world, the way of the flesh, the way of the devil. But confession of sin necessitates a desire and a willingness and a hopefulness to never commit that sin again. I'm not saying that people do not have to confess the same sin over and over again. That's not what I mean. The idea is that when you confess any particular sin, you confess it with the full intent and the desire to not do it again. That's what true confession is. I didn't even plan to say that. But look at Proverbs 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Obviously, that doesn't mean those that cover their sins by pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. It means those that seek to hide their sins from the eyes of other men, or even, if some could be so foolish, to seek to hide their sins from God. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Now, that's a sure promise and a certain promise for us right now that we ought to lay hold of and grab hold of and be encouraged about. 
that these evil, wicked politicians in this world, these evil, wicked people that have covered up their sins and denied that they've committed sins of murder and perjury and lying and theft and every other sort of thing, adultery, I might add, that those that have covered all these things up, that sooner or later those sins will be shouted from the rooftop. They will not prosper. They will not be blessed in their latter end. Don't think that anybody's ever gotten away with their sins because they have not. If it, they've seemingly gotten away with their sins here, they've not gotten away with them hereafter. And does not the Bible say, and be sure your sin will find you out? Does that accept the politicians in America in the 21st century? Does that make an exception for certain individuals overseas who've committed acts of wickedness, who've killed many people? Does that exempt any ruler, any place, anywhere, anytime? No. Be sure your sin will find you out. Haven't you ever noticed that when you see these people in the news reports, that they have the testimony of a bad conscience glowing on their faces and within their eyes, that their body language does not meet their speech. It's because they're already guilty before God. They know they're guilty, and they're condemned in their own conscience because they condemn in others that thing which they allow in themselves. So, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Remember I said about 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14? Confessing and forsaking. Not just confessing that something's sin, but you confess it as sin, and you repudiate it, and repudiate it with the intent of never committing it again. How do you do that with pride? How do you do that with anger? But that's what's required in the Scriptures. He that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Isn't it a, a conditional thing? Look over at Psalm 130, verse 3 for a moment. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If God marks all of our sins and calls us into account for all of them, who shall stand? No one shall stand. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ and God's choosing of us that can ever make us right before Him. And it's only His blood washing us eternally from our sin that gives us right standing. And why do we have a consciousness of sin that those that are not saved do not? Because the Holy Ghost is in us. And He's shown us to be tender-hearted towards God. And since we love God, we do not want to offend Him. Because we love Jesus Christ, we do not want to disobey Him. The desire of our heart is ever to do right. The desire of our heart is ever to do right, to always be right, and to do right forevermore. That's why we desire to leave this present evil world and go be with Him. I desire to be completely free of this body of sin, that this body of sin would be destroyed, as it were, that it would be laid to rest, and that it would, once it's laid to rest, it will never rise again in a corrupt state. It will rise again, but in a state of incorruption. That's what I desire. To go and be absent from the body and be present with the Lord is to be soul and spirit without sin. And when your body is raised up again and joined to your spirit and your soul, your body will be without sin. That's what we desire. But those that confess and forsake their sins shall have mercy. So there's a promise there that mercy, which is the unmerited free favor of God demonstrated by His showing kindness towards you, is in a sense conditional, but in another sense it's unconditional. Um, Psalm 130, verse 4, the next verse. I'll read it in context. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I think I've touched upon this verse within the last year and pointed out that thou mayest be feared. See, men would have a wrong kind of fear of God if they didn't apprehend or understand that there could could be the possibility of forgiveness before God. They would absolutely hate God 
And they would all hate God, and that includes us, if there was no forgiveness. But because there is forgiveness, we fear Him. Because even though we're forgiven our sins, we know that sins here have consequences here. Even though they may not send us to hell in the hereafter. So we tremble. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. Now, Acts chapter 5, verse 30, 31, and 32. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins to give repentance to Israel did he give repentance to the whole nation nobody's given repentance to the Israel of God and as a Christian you're part of it he gave repentance that means he gave the ability to be sorry for their sins to Israel and because they were sorry for their sins and he provided for a payment for their sins, he gave them a pardon or forgiveness for, of their sins. Acts chapter 13, 38 and 39. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ is preached the forgiveness of sins and through no other. Through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We are not to wink at our own sins. We're not to pretend our own sins don't exist. We're not to cover our own sins up. We're to confess and forsake them. And we're not to pretend that the sins of others don't exist. We're not to pretend that any particular crime against God is not a crime against God. We're to look at it all as one of a piece, all rebellion, all obstinate hatred and rejection of God. And is that actually going like this in the face of the living God? All sin is a rejection and exalting of the creature against the Creator and is to be apprehended and understood to be sin by all of us. First, our own sin. See, we must first revenge all disobedience in our own lives before we can be upset with the disobedience in other lives. But where you've gotten right about something and you've stayed right about it, then you have the power to tell somebody else they need to get right about it. You who've been recovered out of strong drink, out of lying, out of theft, out of stealing, perhaps those out there in internet land, out of being a sodomite, Perhaps you've been recovered out of many, many things. Perhaps you were an inveterate thief and a liar. And when you were born again, the Spirit of God quickened you, and you were made afresh and anew in the image of Jesus Christ. And you fought and you battled, and you've won victories over what you once were and what you once did. And what you once were, you are no more. And what you once did, you do no more. Then you have the high ground. And then you can condemn what you used to do in others. Does that mean you condemn them? No, you condemn the sin and tell them they are condemned already because they have not believed upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. And if they continue impenitent, that's not sorry for their sins, and in unbelief, they will, of a surety, certainly they will go to hell. That's the message of Jesus Christ while he was on the earth. That's the message of Jesus Christ preaching in me right now. And I'm going to tell you something I'm going to read now in a moment from Thomas Watson. And Thomas Watson was a Puritan. I want to explicate and give you an understanding from something besides my own mouth of a man of God who lived over 400 years ago and understood what the preaching of the word really is. And he explained it in a brief way, in a way I never could. This is from Thomas Watson's book, The Godly Man's Picture. This is a great little book. You want to see what the standard is, what a godly man is? This man lays it out. He breaks it down in detail under multiple heads and subheadings with very brief little examples from the scripture. And uh, this particular example I'm going to give you is concerning God's written word. And that's the King James Bible as far as he was concerned and as far as we're concerned. 
He says, uh, the word of God is a sovereign comfort in distress. And a godly man loves the word because of the efficacy it has had upon him, the effectualness it has upon us. Then he says this, do we love the word written? That's a question we should ask ourselves. What sums of money the martyrs gave for a few leaves of the Bible? Do we make the word our bosom friend? As Moses often had the rod of God in his hand, so we should have the book of God in our hand. When we want direction, do we consult the sacred oracle? When we find corruptions strong, this is why it touches on the sermon I'm preaching, when we find corruption strong, I don't know about you, but I find my corruption strong every moment of almost every day. And when there's an abatement, they come back with a vengeance. And I again have to seek the Lord and read the word and pray. Without your corruptions, how often would you seek God? Without the vileness within you, and without a sense of your own depravity, how often would you pray? How often would you seek Christ? And how much would you know you need Him? Well, that's a little uh, discourse there. When we want direction, do we consult this sacred oracle, the Word of God? When we find corruption strong, do we make use of this sword of the Spirit to hew them down? That's why people don't like the Bible, because God hews them by the prophets. And when you speak forth the Word of God, you're prophesying, and it cuts them up and leaves, leaves them bleeding on the highway. And they can't stand it. They want to hear good words and fair speeches. They want smooth words that make them feel good and lead them right down further into the vestibule of hell. They don't want something to correct them. They want something to confirm them. They don't want something to turn them from their sin. They want something to confirm them in their sin. We will not give them that here. When we are disconsolate, do we go to this bottle of water of life for comfort? Then we are lovers of the word. But alas, how can they who are seldom conversant with the scriptures say they love them? You say the, you love the Bible, you love Jesus Christ. Count up in one week. They've got a program right now where I work. How many hours a week do you exercise? How many hours in a month did you exercise? People write it down and they take it in on a sheet. Put down how many minutes, let's say minutes first, and then if it adds up to hours, let's call it hours, do you spend with the Bible, with listening to the Word of God, reading the Word of God, or interfacing with the Word of God? That's what he's asking. Um, how can they who are seldom conversant with the Scriptures say they love them? Their eyes begin to be sore when they look at a Bible. The two testaments are hung up like rusty armor, which is seldom or never made use of. The Lord wrote the law with his own finger, but though God took pains to write, men will not take pains to read. They would rather look at a pair of cards than at a Bible. Number two, do we love the word preached? This is what I'm doing now. Do we prize it in our judgments? Do we receive it into our hearts? Do we fear the loss of the word preached more than the loss of peace and trade? Is it the removal of the ark that troubles us? Again, do we attend to the word with reverential devotion? When the judge is giving his charge on the bench, all attend. When the word is preached, the great God is giving us his charge. Do we listen to it as a matter of life and death? This is a good sign that we love the word. Again, do we love the holiness of the word? The word is preached to beat down sin and advance holiness. Do we love it for its spirituality and purity? Many love the word preached only for its eloquence and notion. They come to a sermon as music, as a music lecture, Ezekiel 33, 31, 32, or as a garden to pick flowers, but not to have their lusts subdued or their hearts bettered. They are like foolish women who paint their faces but neglect their health. Again, do we love the convictions of the word? Do we love the word when it comes home to our conscience and shoots it into it arrows of reproof at our sins? It is the minister's duty sometimes to reprove. He who can speak smooth words in the pulpit but does not know how to reprove is like a sword with a fine hilt without an edge. Rebuke them sharply, Titus 2.15. Dip the nail in oil, reprove in love, but strike the nail home. Now, Christian, 
When the word touches on your sin and says, Thou art the man, do you love the reproof? Can you bless God that the sword of the Spirit has divided between you and your lusts? This is indeed a sign of grace and shows that you are a lover of the word. A corrupt heart loves the comforts of the word, but not the reproofs. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. Amos 5.10 Their eyes flash with fire like venomous creatures that at the least touch spit poison. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Acts 7.54 When Stephen touched them to the quick, they were mad and could not endure it. So there's the Puritan speaking about the preaching of the word of God. And you see in the Bible, in Stephen's case, and in Paul's case, in the case of the prophets in the Old Testament, what the plain, unvarnished preaching of the Word of God did, you see where it got them. It caused them to wander in skins, destitute, and hide in caves of the earth. It caused them to be alone under a tree in the wilderness with virtually nothing to eat, God sustaining them day by day with provision from above. It caused them to be sawn asunder, caused them to be hated of all men for his name's sake. But great is their reward in the heaven. So, uh, Acts 26, 17, and 18. Here the Lord speaking through Paul, and Paul's recounting what happened to him. He says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. See, people have to be turned from darkness to light, and from Satan to God, for them to even apprehend the forgiveness of sins that are in the person of Jesus Christ, that are found in His blood, and the life that is found in His resurrection that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is where? In me. Oh, friend out there, how can you not be a Calvinist? The faith is in Him. It's not in you. And if it's in you, your faith in Him was in Him, came out from Him, and returns to Him. Every good and perfect gift coming from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Ephesians 1, 7 and Colossians 1, 14. And what's in Colossians is not something that was copied out of Ephesians into Colossians at a latter date. That's what some bozo told me. And that's what many scholars believe. No, they were not harmonizing one epistle with another. Paul understood the sound soteriology, the sound Christology that was given him from heaven, and he expounded it in all his letters. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Through. You've got to go through the blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. In Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You're bought out of sin with His blood, and your sins are pardoned by His blood. You're bought back from the power of the devil. You're brought out of darkness into His marvelous light by the power of His blood, by the work of His Spirit, through the will of the Father, glorifying His Son, Jesus Christ. 